I apologize if you needed more sugar. Um, I, I, I'm on a, a natural high about all this because this is the part of the day that I have been um, waiting for with much avidity for many a year. Uh, in, uh, in that selfsame 2010 uh, that we keep mentioning, uh, uh, there was a, a, an evening I spent on a Friday uh, in the, as the weather got cold uh, over at NYU uh, giving a talk uh, about a subject called freedom in the cloud, which uh, didn't have any meaning then, but has more now. The consequences of that evening at NYU and that talk about freedom in the cloud became the subject of a book by Jim Dwyer of the New York Times called More Awesome Than Money uh, about the four young men who came out of that talk deciding uh, to accept the technical invitation to federate social networking and eliminate the dreadful harms to human civilization created by Facebook. That was the evening on which I said uh, that Mark Zuckerberg had done more harm to the human race than anybody else his age, a uh, conclusion I have not had to re-examine since. Um, what, 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 what we were talking about then was the idea uh, that we had wound up with a misshapen cloud, uh, one in which uh, everybody's data went out uh, and got hurt on the unlighted streets of the future when what we really wanted was for everybody's data to stay at home and to be shared and processed and used safely, uh, taking advantage of the fact that the world was filling up with cheap, wonderful, accessible hardware of many different kinds, uh, and that if we used free software right, uh, we could restore people's privacy and their security significantly uh, to levels that were threatened by the evolution of the great big give me your data and I'll give you some trivial free services and we'll call it square uh, that we were moving towards. Uh, B. Del Garby, who uh, had to catch yet another airplane today after just getting off one from Japan, walked in uh, uh, on me a few weeks later and said he wanted to help. Uh, and those four wonderful young men, may Ilya rest in peace, went out to do their job, which became the social network called Diaspora. Uh, and we all thought we were just going to get some software together and throw it in some boxes and rock and roll. And years went by. Uh, this is what often happens in free software projects. And then there was a natural disaster, and B. Dale's house became one of 300 that was burned in the Black Forest Fire in Colorado, and two servers and six plugs melted, and we lost many bits, and all sorts of other things happened. And I began to think that this was a dream that I was not going to live to see. Um, but I was saved from that. Uh, and the man who saved me from that is standing here. He, he's um, come a long way uh, to be with us today. I, I, I will let Sunil introduce himself. Uh, but what I will explain is that we're about to watch the first globally broadcast demonstration that Freedom Box, the idea we were talking about all those years ago, uh, is not just possible, it works. Uh, it works, and it works because Sunil and a whole bunch of other people turned up and saved a sinking project. They didn't just keep it uh, ready for the medics. They, they, they finished all this work. And we are now ready to begin to show the future of how we preserve privacy uh, and security in the cloud. Um, so without any further uh, ado, so that I can see a thing my eyes have thirsted for for five long years, I, I offer you uh, Sunil Mohan Adapa and Freedom Box. It works. Thank you, Professor Moglen. I'm Sunil Mohan Adapa. I'm from Hyderabad, India, and it's my immense pleasure today to be presenting to you Freedom Box. I've worked on um, Freedom Box for about 18 months now, and that's where my heart lies. Uh, for a living, of course, I, I do consulting based on free software technologies, uh, mostly on the part-time independent. And I also teach at uh, my alma mater, proudly, um, uh, the 
International Institute of Information Technology, Hyderabad. So uh, let's get started with Freedom Box. Uh, I'll, I'll demonstrate Freedom Box to you. We all use devices, laptops, mobile phones, every day to create, access, and content, uh, share content. But more of the utility, more, more and more, the utility of these devices is actually coming from the cloud services. And these services are provided to us by data mining companies. They put on a face and then they come out as email service providers, social networking providers, and file sharing providers. But in fact, what they are, are data mining companies. And to, to them, we're just a commodity to be traded for profit. Our privacy is something for them to be traded as profit. And the moment they start respecting our privacy, they won't make any money. And this is a problem for us. And if we are privacy respecting individuals, we're already looking for alternatives. And we always question, is there an alternate to, to, uh, to, uh, to the dependence that we have on these social networks and services that we're using from the cloud? Is there such an alternate to, is it even possible to build such, a, uh, such an alternate to? Technically, is it possible? Let us for a moment imagine that we have a device at our home, at every home, and this device would provide us all of these services. It would also store our data. It would sync this data to all of our devices, mobile phones and laptops and so on. It would be accessible from everywhere. And it will respect our privacy. And most importantly, it will then become a cloud, a personal cloud that we control rather than one that controls us. And Freedom Box is that device, something that respects our privacy. Freedombox is a free software stack that runs on physical hardware and is built as a part of the Debian universal operating system. And it runs on a whole bunch of hardware. So we can see here, this is, a, this is actually a commercial custom designed uh, product but it also runs on several uh, uh, single board computers that are, that are very popular with enthusiasts and so on. And it can even run on a salvaged old computer that we, we brought from SFLC. And today I'm going to demonstrate to you uh, Freedom Box working um, and providing several of these services to show you that it is indeed possible to provide these services, one. And it also runs on devices uh, such as this and that. And uh, most importantly, it can, it can provide us these services for as cheap as $35. The Raspberry Pi 2 is actually just $35. So let's get started. Um, this, this Freedom Box device must be a consumer electronics device, meaning that it, its operation has to be as close to uh, operating, setting up and operating a, a personal uh, smartphone rather than setting up a server by a system administrator. So we're going to go through that setup process first. So first, I connect uh, internet cable from an ISP, and then I connect the power. And that is how we turn on Freedom one home at a time. So Freedom Box then does a whole bunch of setup activities, recognizes what kind of hardware it's running on, and ultimately just provides us a Wi-Fi network to access further services. But meanwhile, let me tell you a little bit more about Freedom Box, what it actually provides. It's a sort of a router. So it sits between uh, our mobile devices and computers and the internet, just like a Wi-Fi router at home that we already have. It's, it, it's a replacement for a Wi-Fi router, but it does more. So we have all of these nasty advertisements tracking us and violating our privacy and, uh, and some web bugs that are being 
served from uh, malicious internet websites and Freedom Box makes sure that those, web, those uh, things never even reach your devices. It doesn't matter if the device is a television or a, or a smartphone, uh, the, those nasty things don't ever reach. And if you choose, Freedom Box can actually take the traffic and route through several computers on the internet through onion routing and then it can enhance our privacy and security. And when we're outside uh, our homes, we can securely connect back to the Freedom Box and access various services which are at, available at home, including a accessing, uh, for example, electronics at home, which are electronic appliances and Internet of Things, or a secure communication line, even when the network we are connecting from is untrusted. So these are some of the routing capabilities that Freedom Box can do. But on top of that, there's a second part to Freedom Box, which is, which is providing various services which will help us uh, relieve us of the dependency that we have on the cloud. So Freedom Box has services uh, wherein we can uh, share our files and we can do photo sharing and we, we have a calendaring services much like uh, how Gmail and Yahoo provide us and a whole bunch of other things and all without spying on us. And more things are coming uh, all the time. We're building more and more services and what, what's in the pipeline is uh, a personal email server, a replacement for uh, Facebook based on GNU Social and, and Diaspora. And, and many, many more things. I mean, we, I, I'll talk a little bit about that later. So by now, uh, actually, for quite some time now, that uh, Freedom Box is ready and waiting for us. Let's connect to it. So I see a Freedom Box network. U using the password that is already provided with the device, I connect to this wireless network. And then I open up my browser. And then I visit a pre-designated URL. And then I see the setup. All it is telling me right now is that there are only a couple of steps remaining and then congratulations on setting up Freedom Box. So let's move on to the next step. And of course, we need to create an account to manage all the functions of uh, Freedom Box later on. So that's what it is asking us to create, an account. I created that account and we're done. On this third step, what, what Freedom Box is showing us is, is the typical setup it assumes that we're setting up for. Um, it's explaining the network configuration, saying that it's sitting between your devices at home and, and the internet. But then, this is not the only purpose Freedom Box can be used for. So we can actually carry it along with us to, say, a Wi-Fi, uh, free Wi-Fi uh, providing uh, place, or home, or, or work, or school. And then we can use our uh, laptops to connect to Freedom Box, and then Freedom Box can connect to the Wi-Fi network, and it can provide a whole lot of services for us. But it can also be taken to a village, uh, like a village in India, and then can be used to uh, provide communications for the people there. And for those kinds of setups, uh, I, I might have to go and little, tweak a little bit with the network configuration, but for, for this kind of setup at home, it's kind of done. And so we can jump straight ahead to applications and start using them. I'll come back to that later. Let me take a little bit of distraction to talk about the support uh, hardware that Freedom Box supports. So this particular device that we're looking at uh, is based on a single board computer called Kavitruck with added storage and a, a nice finished custom casing. And it runs entirely on free software, meaning that anyone can study how the device works and they can also modify and redistribute the improvements. And not only is the uh, entire software free, uh, 
the firmware, the software that is required to run the components inside the device is also free. This essentially means that there are no NSA backdoors that can escape the eyes of the community. And uh, this is yet another uh, single board computer. And on top of uh, running on completely free software and free firmware, it's also open source hardware. Meaning the community can actually examine how uh, the devices are, uh, are built together and then even make modifications and build a completely modified device. And in Freedombox, of course, we give higher priority to these uh, open, open source hardware. This is the original device for which Freedombox was targeted, the Dream Plug. Uh, this is a device that we can buy uh, on the market today, and it has good networking capabilities, and Freedombox runs uh, straight away on that. Of course, the Raspberry Pi is an educational device that has made news by reaching millions of homes, and in order to reach millions of those users and let them convert their Raspberry Pis into Freedomboxes, we also support Raspberry Pi. And the newer version of uh, Raspberry Pi, which is the Raspberry Pi 2, uh, which, which has a uh, lot more juice in it, it is also supported. And that's not all, actually. Um, if you have a, an old computer like that one, uh, sitting at home, not doing anything, um, we can put it to good use. Um, or if we have an old laptop running around not being used, we can also turn that into a freedom box by first installing Debian operating system on it, and then it's just a matter of installing a package on top of that. And it's not even necessary to actually have an entire computer allocated to freedom box. We can carve out some of the resources of freedom box uh, using virtualization technology, and then on that virtual machine, we can run Freedom Box. No matter what the uh, operating system there is on the computer, without disturbing that operating system, we can actually run Freedom Box on the site. So, uh, so since Debian is the universal operating system, rightly earning its name by running from a phone to a supercomputer, essentially this means Freedom Box can run on all of those devices. Now let's get back to uh, looking at how uh, Freedom Box deals with uh, applications. Now I said that, I claim that uh, Freedom Box has to be a, uh, as simple as using a smartphone and uh, it has to do a much harder job because it is kind of trying to replace a system administrator. And uh, my mother has to be able to use a Freedom Box at home. So uh, I jump to the applications. Uh, I am um, greeted with a lot of applications. I pick one. And the first time I try to access an application, Freedom Box will prompt me that, uh, to install that application. So I go ahead and choose to install that application. Now Freedom Box, after downloading this application, will of course install it and run it. But uh, to get it up and running, it has to answer a lot of questions. It has to play the system administrator. And it has to uh, make the decisions on behalf of the user, uh, typically made by system administrator when setting up a server. And of course, it sides with, the, with privacy and security whenever, it's, when, whenever that choice comes up. And the application that we are currently installing is is known as Preboxy. It's a it's a proxy server that sits on Freedom Box and kind of routes all the tra internet traffic from our devices to the internet. And what it does is it enhances our privacy by making sure that nasty advertisements don't crop up in our uh, in our browsers. And once this application is installed you would notice one very interesting thing, that it has only just one single control, enable, disable. And the rest of it is automatically taken care by Freedom Box. And the remaining page will just talk about how to use this application on your device. And that's how everything else is in Freedom Box, for the most part of it. So to demonstrate how uh, Preboxy works, I've chosen a, a 
a typical newspaper website that I frequently visit and it has like plenty of ads and we'll see how uh, Freedom Box uh, screens them out and, and stops them from tracking me every time I go there. So we have uh, pretty much finished the installation process. And as you can see, uh, there are a whole bunch of instructions on how to use the application and then there's just one control, enable and disable. Let's see how this application works. So first, I visit a web page that I frequent. And I'm greeted with ads on the top and on the side. And then the loading of the page hasn't finished yet. And a lot of distraction and glare with all of those flashing stuff. And most importantly, it's violating my privacy. It's tracking me wherever I am. And as you can see, Jimmy Dean is that burger that I don't even get in India. <laughs> right? I mean, it knows that I'm here and tracking me from here. The same page I try to visit. Uh, by uh, going through Freedom Box and the page is already loaded. And there are no ads and no tracking. So that was Prevoxy. And there are more applications. So I'm going to uh, talk about a few more of them. And, and Tor is a very important piece. It, Tor is an immense success story of uh, reporters, human rights activists, and people behind repressive regimes trying to reach out the in, uh, internet without censorship. And it has worked very brilliantly, and uh, it's a part of Freedom Box. I'll tell a little bit about uh, Tor for the people who are not very aware of it. What it does is it takes uh, the traffic from a machine, and then it bounces through various computers on the internet before actually reaching the final destination web server. Now, the final destination server there, uh, that's what uh, the, uh, 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 sorry, the web server that, that, uh, that we're trying to reach thinks that we're actually coming from the final Tor node. And the rest of the Tor nodes actually uh, only know the immediate uh, node uh, before it and after it, and they never know the final, no, final uh, origin or the source of the traffic. And everything in green there is actually completely encrypted. And this works very well as attested by the NSA. So we can take a look at how that works as well. So first, let me try to visit a, a page that shows me my location and IP address. So it's, it's actually telling me from, uh, I'm from Columbia University Network, and then I'm from New York, United States. It's showing me that my IP address. This is how website, websites mainly track us. And I do the same thing with uh, the Tor browser bundle. Now, what Tor is trying to do here is construct a circuit wherein it will bounce all of my traffic from one computer to another computer, possibly across continents, and then finally reach the destination server. Now, the server obviously thinks now that I am from Germany, and we can even see how our packets got bounced. First, they went to Germany, came back to United States, went back to Germany, and then finally reached the uh, server I wanted to go to. I can request a completely new circuit, and then now it thinks I'm from France. Uh, this time, Germany, Italy, and then France. So not only does Freedom Box uh, use the Tor network, but it also participates in that Tor network, meaning that it will help other Freedom Box nodes and other Tor nodes carry all that traffic from, uh, bounce around the traffic, and then finally take it to the destination. So Freedom Box, in fact, strengthens the Tor node itself by 
by numbers, the strength of the Tor node is increased. So just by installing Tor and, uh, and, and, and having Freedom Box, we're helping humanitarian crosses across the world. So uh, I'll give another example of an application that uh, I can use to connect to Tor. So I have this instant messenger configured to go through Tor, and then I've created an account pretty much anonymously, not giving away any of my details. And then when I go online, I can talk to people, uh, uh, contact people and talk to them, completely staying anonymous. So I've added a bunch of uh, uh, people that I know that I wish to speak to, and uh, those people should uh, show up on the uh, on my friend's rooster here. And and they need not be uh, identified as well. They can create anonymous accounts themselves, and we can we can essentially talk to talk to each other completely, staying anonymous. For every server that Tor reaches, it sets, it sets up a new circuit, so sometimes it takes a little bit, but it's a price to pay for anonymity. Small price, that's. Okay, without using up all my time, I'll just, I'll just uh, uh, skip to the other uh, interesting stuff. So, it's not just possible to stay anonymous while we are, uh, uh, while we are uh, accessing the internet, but even when we become a server and giving, providing the services, either to ourselves when we're remote or to uh, friends and family, uh, whenever we're being a server and providing the services, even then we can stay anonymous. And this is known as a uh, Tor hidden service. As you can see here, the, the server and the client both stay completely anonymous. Okay, okay, now we are ready. So let's go back and check. Right, um, so uh, I can stay completely anonymous and, and still have a meaningful conversation. So, um, right, uh, so, uh, uh, so when, when someone tries to actually connect from uh, a Tor net to, to, to the Tor network uh, onto a hidden service like, like the ones that provided by Freedom Box, we meet at a center point called rendezvous point and then uh, both the, uh, the party accessing the service as well as the party providing the service, both can stay anonymous. And Freedom Box has hidden services built into it. So it's just a, a checkbox away and hidden service will be set up for you automatically. So let me access uh, Freedom Box, uh, one of the services of Freedom Box on this, on the, uh, as a hidden service. So th there's a wiki, uh, just like uh, Wikipedia, a lot less pretty, prettier, but uh, a wiki uh, that is available on Freedom Box. Uh, known as IkiWiki, and I can essentially access this wiki and Sorry about this. All right.
right? I can access this wiki. And provide information. Imagine that um, I'm a I'm a reporter, or I'm a whistleblower trying to provide information to a reporter, and both parties would like to be uh, completely anonymous to each other. And uh, I can provide the information in this manner uh, without ever having to uh, reveal myself. And the service uh, provider need not also reveal themselves in in the process. So that was a hidden wiki. And Freedom Box also takes care of a lot of security related aspects. So it automatically sets up a firewall and then opens up the ports as we enable the services and, and disable those ports as we disa uh, disable the services. And then it also does, uh, using the power of Debian, it also does automatic security upgrades every night so that uh, any, any security problems that are found in software, they get automatically patched overnight. And all of the, uh, as long as Tor is, is enabled on Freedom Box, uh, all the applications and uh, the updates are completely uh, downloaded via the Tor network. This adds a level of uh, anonymity and uh, um, uh, security to the system. When we're outside our homes, we can connect back to sec uh, Freedom Box in a secure manner even if the network that we're connecting from is an un unsecured network uh, via the virtual private network system. And Freedom Box has a, uh, has a, a VPN server running on it. And when we connect to uh, uh, our, back to our home, we can, uh, we can do various things. Uh, one thing, we can actually access all the privately available services that are only available at home, and two, we can reach out other computers on the home network, could be electronic devices and internet of things and so on, we can control our events and stuff. And three, we can choose to route all of our traffic from our mobile phones, etc., via the Freedom Box at home. So we'll be using our internet connection at home and the Freedom Box at home to route all our traffic. And the intermediary who might be monitoring the network, they get nothing. So, and then uh, many, many times when we're using uh, commercial, uh, uh, commercial VPN services that are available out there, uh, they're not, uh, they're not so easy to set up. And in Freedom Box, one of the challenges that we're trying to address is, is simplicity of use. So here I have a, a, a typical Android mobile phone, and I have installed uh, OpenVPN application here, and I, I'll show you how we connect to uh, uh, connect back to home when I'm, uh, when I'm taking this phone and re reaching elsewhere. So uh, here, first thing, I, uh, I'm pretty sorry for the poor quality, but I hope you can see me accessing the Freedom Box page there. So I went into the Freedom Box page, and then I visit the OpenVPN part of it, OpenVPN application there. And then it gives me there one download button, which is the OpenVPN profile. And then I click on it, and then it asks me to download, and, I've, and I'm pretty much finished with the download. And the rest of the instructions are pretty much telling me to uh, access an Android application and feed it this particular profile. So I've downloaded and installed this application, and then I'm, what I'm doing is feeding that profile from here. And then we're done. And all we need to do now in order to connect whenever I want to connect to home securely is just to tap this button. So it's connecting and then we're done. All the communication from the phone now goes to the Freedom Box device in a secure manner nobody can snoop on. We also have a, a, a very interesting uh, VIP wipe solution uh, in Freedom Box. So we can do group audio chats. In fact, we do that uh, for the Freedom Box uh, discussions that we have every month. Uh, all the developers gather together, and even on a uh, on a modest hardware like the uh, like the thirty five dollar Raspberry Pi, we can support a very large number of developers. And this happens at a very high quality on a, on very low bandwidth. 
So, Mumble uh, makes that happen. So, I'll give a, a short demo of that as well. So, I connect here to uh, the Freedom Box Mumble server. So, Nick, one of our contributors, is also connected onto that already. And I'm opening my Mumble client on my Android phone, and then after a click away, I've connected to the network. And let me try to talk to Nick. Hello, Nick. Hello. Hi, Sunil. Where are you exactly? What's up? Where are you exactly, Nick? Where are you talking from, Nick? Around campus enjoying scenery. <laughs> you mean you're not part of the presentation? <laughs> All right, thank you. And own cloud is what makes Freedom Box a drop in replacement for Dropbox. <laughs> With all the pun intended. <laughs> Um, so with with own cloud we can we can upload our files we can share those files with other collaborators and not just that we can also manage our contacts and calendars uh, and do pretty much a lot of other things so let's take a look at how that works so it has a beautiful nice web interface but that's not all of it let me first upload a, a, a file onto it, this very presentation itself, and it's been uploaded. Now I go to, and I go to this application on Freedom Box, and it has automatically synced already. You can see the freedombox.pdf is available there. And I try to open it up, and there it is this very presentation that I'm giving here. And let me do a little bit more with that. It's also possible to create the documents and edit documents from right within own cloud. So I, I can open up an office document and then say hello. And I can create also calendar events and and share my schedule with other people. Oh, it's actually asking me for location. I'm happy to give it this time because this is my Freedom Box and it's not ever reporting that location to someone else. So we have uh, the event schedule. I can reschedule them and, and so on. We keep using a lot of applications from the internet uh, and these applications are very innovative sometimes and there many of them are even free software. And uh, we always wonder uh, even if uh, from uh, sm small note notepad sort of applications or note taking applications to uh, office suites. And then we're happy to use them as long as the data is with us and our privacy is not violated. And then we often wonder is this possible to use those applications yet keep the data with us. And, uh, and with a service called remote storage that is available on Freedom Box, it's possible. So what we would do essentially is load the application from its regular location on the internet, but when, when it comes time to share, uh, store the data or retrieve it, that happens on the local Freedom Box. So remote storage is actually remote for the application, local for us on our Freedom Box. So this is how it works. We can, we can quickly take a look at one of these applications that is out there. It's, it's a very simple uh, note-taking application called Lightrite. So this essentially is, is greeting me with a, a 
with a default node. On the top right, I have this uh, way to log into my account. And this is an identity that I've created on my Freedombox device. And it's not an account that I created with the service, with the application provider. And, and when I try to log in, it's of course uh, asking me for a uh, password. And then I provide this. And I can see that some of the nodes that I've already stored with this particular account have been retrieved and I'm able to edit them now. So that's how remote storage works. We also have uh, the BitTorrent uh, downloading application. So we can browse the internet and when we encounter a BitTorrent URL, and we want to do peer-to-peer -peer download for it, we can take the uh, URL and then feed it to the Freedom Box. Freedom Box will then download the content and then make it available for other applications to use and share. So for example, OwnCard can pick up those uh, files that we just downloaded and then um, make it available on the mobile phone. It can even make it available on a television uh, if it's a if it's a, a video content, I can actually feed the URL to Freedom Box and then watch it on TV. So let's take a look at that as well. So I have this application called Transmission, which is the, uh, which is the application for uh, uh, downloading torrents on Freedom Box. So I have here with me uh, a torrent URL uh, from my earlier browsing session hosted by the wonderful people at the internet.org, internet archive. And then I've uploaded the torrent and then I will wait for Freedom Box to actually complete the download. So it's downloaded and then I can now go to my my phone again and using the own cloud application here hold on yes i've opened that uh, ebook that i've just downloaded it's a bunch of essays from richard stall And that's only a, a small subset of the applications that I wanted, I've chosen to demonstrate today, but Freedombox has more applications. And the good thing is we're building more and more applications every month, and we're making a lot of progress, and we're, we're picking up pace as well. Some of the things that are already in the pipeline are uh, a distributed social network based on GNU Social and Diaspora, and we also like to have some obviously missing stuff such as email server, personal email, secure personal email server. And we also want to improve the user experience even further by having single sign-on with uh, PGP client certificates and even having a browser assistant that sits with the browser and then helps us discover and use the services of Freedom Box without having to read those instructions and, and following them. And we want to support more hardware, reach out more people. And these, uh, and we're, we want to provide uh, 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 open hardware, more priority, and then support those as well. So a lot, lot many applications are actually coming. Some of these applications might not seem like new thing, but do not forget, let me remind you in fact, that uh, they're running on hardware that is as cheap as $35 uh, with very little computing power and they're going to sit at home and the setup is just one click away for all of these applications. So I have to talk about uh, how I got involved in Freedom Box in the first place. So when Imagine uh, someone, uh, some, we're in a tight spot and then someone has a medical emergency, right? And uh, we say, is anyone here a doctor? And then 
doctor raises a hand and says, yeah, and then we all be, uh, believe that it's the duty of the doctor to go help, help the patient. And in our society today, we have a serious problem. On one hand, we have all our communications becoming digital. We communicate more on the internet uh, via social networks and so on with, our, with people. And we communicate less on face-to-face -face discussions like this. And on the other hand, we have mass surveillance. And all of our worst fears have been confirmed to be true in the past year or so. And not just government, bad government surveillance, uh, the, the corporates that we, w that we entrusted our data with, they are doing mass surveillance as well. And, and in a society where everything is monitored, it's not possible to freely communicate. It's not possible to freely talk, freely write, or even freely think. So we have a massive problem with us. And then I hear voices saying, is someone here an engineer? Because the problem is technical and it can, a large part of the solution to this problem is also technical. And then I raised my hand. And then I looked at uh, the projects that were around uh, uh, that are trying to solve this problem. And what I found is that Freedom Box is a project that is on the right goals with the right ideals. And, and so I happened to join the project. And when I got there, actually, I, I raised the hand with a little bit of a hesitance, thinking, uh, what difference can I make coming to the project? And then I got there, I showed up, and then I found a whole bunch of brilliant people working already on the problem and then contributing to the project. And, it's, and, and, and the Freedom Box project is just a tip of the iceberg, right? And then we have giants, like the Debian project, uh, the GNU project, the Linux project, and a whole bunch of other people trying to build uh, federated systems, trying to build peer-to-peer -peer systems, and uh, they're doing great strides. And Freedom Box is, is, is a critical part in all of this, trying to bring things together and make it simple for people to use and actually get to the homes. And there is a huge amount of work to be done uh, in the coming days. And, and this is a challenge that is, that is very hard to solve. And we could use all the help that we need, um, that we can get. Uh, and, and, and the good part is uh, you don't have to be an engineer to contribute to the project. Uh, there are many, many ways to contribute to the project. And if you are an individual or a corporate uh, looking to contribute, please join us. Um, the uh, Freedom Box Foundation is hosting a hackathon tomorrow at the Software Freedom Law Center. And we're doing everything from installing and turning computers into Freedom Boxes to uh, getting a lot of work done and brainstorming and, uh, and telling people how to get involved with the project. You want to interact with us in any way, get started. Please come there. Thank you very much, and we have time for questions and answers. Of, is the entry of credentials, at least at the initiation, protected under the current system? You mean the uh, setup create, at the setup process? The, uh, the initial setup process where we went through a wizard and provided an administrator account? No, no. The, every time you go on to this thing with your password and ID, whatever username, is that protected in a public setting? Y yes. Uh, currently, what we have are self-signed certificates, which are not ideal. But they can be made to work by first noting down uh, the certificate signature, and then wherever we go and try to access the uh, computer, we can note them down. But Mozilla uh, and uh, and other uh, other entities together are doing a brilliant work there. So they they are on a project called Let's Encrypt, which is 
which is aiming to provide free SSL certificates for the entire planet. And uh, we will hopefully be one of the earliest adopters of that project. And whenever we're trying to log in from a remote location to uh, into Freedom Box, it will be over a secure channel. Even now it is over secure channel, but we're doing self-signed certificates now. And then when let, Let's Encrypt arrives, we'll be doing proper secure certificates. And not, and sorry. Yes, yes, yes. Even if the, uh, if, even if the Wi-Fi network itself is, is in, insecure completely, uh, we have our computer and, the, of course, our computer has to be secure, but, uh, and then our computer to the Freedom Box, it's encrypted. And we're doing uh, a bit more with that, actually. Uh, we have something called PGP client certificates. We're using the uh, web of trust uh, among people, and then we're building uh, a login mechanism based on that. And then we can set that up on our computer, and we wouldn't even have to log in in order to access the uh, services of Freedom Box. Hi, uh, first off. Thank you so much for your work. I am like vibrating with excitement. This, this is so great. Thank you. Yeah, which leads me to like the tiresome project manager asks, so what's your timeline on this type question? Um, and I, I, I recognize that there's going to be a 1.0 release, which I don't think there has been yet, correct? And there'll be a moment where you can buy your own hardware and install stuff on it. And there might be a separate moment where I can just buy someone else for their birthday a freedom box and say here plug it in right are those tell me could you tell me what the timeline is on me doing either of those exceedingly exciting things Ooh, ah right okay um we have already made releases that are actually useful uh, for people now and uh, they take a little bit of technical expertise to set up uh, what we're requiring now is to uh, actually buy one of those devices and plug in an sd card uh, but even that we'd like to avoid by having like a finished product. Um, and we'll have that hopefully soon, but, uh, but I think uh, Ivan can say something on that. Well, how about tomorrow? Oh. Could I have this one? Come to uh, 1995 Broadway tomorrow, 17th floor. Bring a thing, we'll make a freedom box out of it for you. Bring two, we'll make two, and you can give one away tomorrow afternoon. Oh, we also... By the way... Yeah. Uh, got some SD cards, by Yeah, yes, yes. Uh, anybody got a 12-year-old a, a at home with a Raspberry Pi? Surely there must be somebody here with a Raspberry Pi and a 12-year-old somewhere? Yeah? Yes, okay. Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> oh, I, I, I like that a lot. Uh, I like that a lot. Uh, one for Opal. You, you, you'll, you'll have to get in the share. Uh, anybody else want to give a, a somebody? Yeah, there we go. Uh, yeah, but yeah. buddy's a smart one. That has an SD card. Am I out of SD cards? Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. All right, great. So, and one more. Okay, there we go. Yeah, there you go. So, here. Uh, th there you go. See, um... <laughs> There's one more. <laughs> uh, you like that? Yeah. It, it'll get better. It, it'll get much better. Uh, but it's pretty good now. It's pretty good now. Tomorrow, uh, 1995 Broadway, 17th floor. Bring anything you want. Uh, 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 coming soon to an, in, uh, an Android-powered dishwasher near you. <laughs> uh, every IoT object should be a secure telephone, right? Let's give the people who listen to the human race some real heartache. Neil? You know? Sure. So um, Freedom Box is great. I, I first heard about it when we had a DebConf here in New York over there somewhere, somewhere in, somewhere in Colombia, that way, somewhere over that way. Um, and the ability to do this is, is really quite important, I think, for user freedoms and, and being able to, to have people have control over their own software. But this is not a battle which has been won. Um, for example, recently the FCC had proposals to lock down any device which uses a wireless spectrum. So they are saying that manufacturers, in order to achieve a FCC certification, so you can use it in the US, the manufacturers have to stop their users being able to install whatever software they want. So this is something I think we, we need to remain vigilant about and need to, even now where 
free software is becoming accepted as a, as a normal practice, um, we need to be careful that um, things like Freedom Box and things like Debian and um, even your ability to change your software on your Android phone is something that's not through malice, I believe, but through a lack of understanding of the requirements um, for um, for user freedom it is being threatened quite a lot. Um, fortunately, in the UK, we, we don't have quite so much um, regulations, although in some ways it's worse, in some ways it's better. But I'd, I'd advise everyone here, um, especially if if you're a lawyer or, or you're a student to not a, to look at the wider context here. There's a lot of areas which impact free software that may not be immediately obvious. Um, so something um, like uh, wireless telephony regulation isn't something that immediately springs to mind when you're thinking, oh, what can I put on, on my computer? But it does have a very direct impact on projects like this uh, and on your ability to do things. May I, may I just uh, start first? Um, this would have been exactly my question. I think uh, the, the idea is really great, um, but has somehow it obviously it conflicts freedom and privacy probably uh, conflicts with um, the interests of the authorities. So did you speak to local country authorities about that? I think that goes a little bit into your direction, which you said here in the United States will probably be seen in a, in a, in a different way. Is there experience on that already? Yes, we are not going to check with anybody. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, I got to be a little egotistical. I uh, actually organized the event. David was the man who right. made that talk on freedom that's in the correct, cloud possible. Right, right. The yes. Internet Society right. was the host that evening. That's, that's right. right. Okay, so now a, qu a quick question here. Uh, it's mundane. Um, could uh, first my first thought um, a little. Whatever. Uh, could uh, Freedom Box uh, software be ported to OpenBSD? First question. Could it run in the cloud? That's the second question. These are should be easy questions. And finally, uh, would you be interested in working with a hardware developer who might actually build a hardware Freedom Box or chip? Well, the, to, to to answer your first question, uh, you you can run the Debian user land on an OpenBSD kernel. It will take a little bit of uh, uh, effort, but the fact is that the box that ran OpenBSD would run Debian, so you could do it that way too, unless you particularly care uh, for having OpenBSD running rather right. than the Linux kernel and the Debian user land. Remy, did you want to say something about that? OLPC has, initially when they rolled out the 1.0, um, they were doing 802.11b and they were trying to do mesh networking and they decided to go with ad hoc Wi-Fi instead. Um, I don't know if when you initially thought of Freedom Box, is there any mesh networking that has where we, they can we, talk we have, to we each have, other? We have lots of plans with respect to mesh awesome. and we follow the mesh world very carefully. When James and I were working on this before he got to OITP, Sasha Meinrath was one of our in, uh, earliest technical advisors. We mm -hmm. plan to keep uh, using more and more ways of creatively employing spectrum to provide secure communications. David, you're, you, you, th th there were other questions that were also relevant yeah, you could run it on a cloud server, sure. You might want to wonder about the security of that because of the side channel to the virtual machine. Uh, and uh, the uh, box that Sunil began with, the Freedom Box Danube edition produced by our colleague Marcus Sabadello, uh, is an early example of the custom hardware meant for running Freedom Box. The QB truck is a lovely piece of hardware for us because we can run it all free bits, all free firmware, all free everything. 
and in addition to being a lovely piece of, uh, of hardware from the freedom point of view, it also makes, as you see, uh, a nice consumer product. I expect that we will be in the world of licensing the Freedom Box trademark and brand and other elements to manufacturers to make these devices in many parts of the world uh, in coming years. There are, after all, a cloud of devices in everybody's future. And we think that one of them ought to work for you. And we think there are a lot of consumers who are going to think that too, and businesses will come. That's, that's what we believe about that. Other questions? OK, you can imagine what it feels like actually to see this really there. Give a microphone, Ben. By default, um, does Freedombox run uh, with the Tor? Uh, does it run as a client, or, uh, or does it run a relay? Because I think the latter would might like be a security violation for people that don't realize like how much of a burden it's taking on. Am if you were going to run as a tour relay, you would have to check another box. Okay, so it's, it's opt-in. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. And also, um, uh, a lot of IS, uh, like residential ISPs in the United States, uh, like even Google Fiber, they um, their terms of service um, disallow of running a publicly accessible server um, or a, a web server. How would you um, go about dealing with that? By running a hidden service. Okay, thanks. Anybody else? Just a quick follow-up. The, the default configuration for Tor, is it, uh, if you set up the relay, is it an exit node or not? No. Okay. Sorry, Sunil. I, I, I no, no, no. Simple, I was simple questions a fool can answer. Thank you very much for the presentation. I'd like to ask you something. If we try to move uh, all the information from the cloud or the public cloud, the private one, doesn't matter to our houses, then we will still be dependent from the internet connection. And uh, because there will always be a need to control things, as we do here in Colombia for, for obvious reasons and we lock VPN, I'm sure that many internet providers will soon do the same. So what are we going to do then after that? Fight for network neutrality, isn't that the point? The whole object of the subject is to make sure that we are not limited by telecommunications intermediaries with respect to the services, services we offer or the ports or addresses to which we want to connect. That fundamental principle does indeed have to be reflected in legal activity as it has already been reflected in the Netherlands, in Canada, in Chile, and in other places. We are, as Michi pointed out earlier, uh, in the afternoon actively engaged in India at the moment where Mr. Zuckerberg's idea that he can buy the de-anonymized packets of several tens of millions of poor people by offering, quote, free service uh, is the leading example of the distortion of the net in the direction that you're suggesting. Freedom Box is not intended to be a technical solution to every problem. In these classrooms here at this law school, when I am teaching here, I am always saying that technology, politics, and law are three legs on a stool, and you can never stand without all three of them. What we have been attempting to do, and what Sunil, as a leader of this team, has now achieved, is that we can begin to show practically, accessibly, at real low prices in ways that everybody can accept the level of technical solutions we can apply. That done, it allows us to focus our politics and our legal activity on the parts that our technical solutions cannot reach. I do want to go back to your point about we are always dependent on the internet supplier. One of the things that Sunil said at the beginning is you can put a box in a village and it provides the telecoms for the village. We already have among Sunil's colleagues in Andhra Pradesh people out engaged in putting freedom boxes in schools and other places in rural Andhra Pradesh. My goal on that subject is a box on the top of a pole covered by a solar panel which provides telecommunications, storage, and various forms of secure communication in a village and which, using WiMAX or other medium-range wireless communication, can provide village-to-village -village hopping. When you have provided secure voice communications, conferencing, messaging, and all other forms of local communication at the village level, you have created a village level telecommunications operator who has no oligopolistic connections. 
When you have connected two villages or three villages or four, you have begun to create a bottom-up telecommunications network, which we will begin to see around the world in the next decade. The next thing I would point out about that is that we already possess some very extraordinary free software called OpenBTS. The purpose of which is to allow general purpose computers running free software with a small, cheap, add-on hardware board to be cell phone base stations capable of communicating with ordinary GSM handsets unmodified. So go back again to that freedom box sitting on a pole in a village getting its uh, uh, electricity from the sun capable of communicating using OpenBTS with every GSM handset present in that village. Now you have, in addition to everything else, a local cellular communications company also generated only on the basis of hardware that it costs a few dozen dollars to provide. I accept your general principle about the way the network works, but I do want to say that it is the work being done by people like Sunil and his colleagues in Freedom Box that will, in the 2020s, allow us to challenge completely the global telecommunications oligopolists for short and medium range telecommunications for which people now have no alternatives. And that will also change the balance of power in the monitoring regime around the world fiercely. All right. We're all going to have more chance to think about this. We're going to do much more work. If you're even marginally interested, come to SFLC tomorrow and figure out how you want to get involved. You want to hack something, you want to learn something, you want to install something. This is the beginning of the way we change the network so that it reflects our aspiration for people's freedoms. Thank you very much. Thank you.